Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Well, good morning, church. Glad you guys are here on Memorial Day weekend. Um, love James's communion meditation, right? The, the ultimate memorial of, of Jesus' body and his blood. Um, the Landis family celebrated Memorial Day yesterday morning um, by doing the most American thing you could think about. We went to the donut shop. You go to the donut shop on Saturday morning and it's, we live down the street from it, and so the boys get in their little electric car, and they start driving. And this thing's a little bit faster than I can walk, and so we're jogging. The neighbors think we're getting good family exercise. And I say, no, we're just going to the donut shop. That's what we do. And Zeke was feeling ultra patriotic, and so he ends up getting a donut with an American flag in it. And so as Zeke's driving back, Ike is holding up the American flag as we're driving through the neighborhood from the donut shop. What a great Memorial Day weekend start, absolutely. I don't know if you've heard, but uh, Brady Galloway, who's joining us on staff, celebrated Memorial Day weekend by getting married yesterday, and so that was very exciting, and I don't think they're doing anything right now. Shoot, let's give them a call. Let's give them a call real quick. No, I won't do that to him. Memorial Day weekend is a lot of fun, a lot of time of remembering, a lot to be thankful for. And as I was preparing for this sermon, one of the intros I was thinking about through this idea of story time is my grandpa. Because we all have grandpa and grandpa stories. And you guys know what grandpa stories are. Grandpa stories are awesome. They're memorable. Something that we think about that we remember because our grandpa told it to us. Now, my grandpa, I loved him. He passed away when I was growing up, but his stories will last forever in our family. I will tell you this, of course. If I were to tell you half of, half of grandpa's stories from here on stage, though, um, I don't think I would make it through Memorial Day weekend with a job, uh, so I cannot share all the grandpa stories that we have, but one of them is this. Is I remember my grandpa always drove super slow, typical grandpa-type driver, 10, 15 miles under the speed limit. My dad would say he would always give him a hard time as people are zooming past him and say, why don't you at least drive the speed limit? My grandpa would tell my dad, I've been in a hurry my whole life. I'm not in a hurry anymore. That's a good grandpa story. When I was texting my family, thinking about what they think about with grandpa stories that we remember, we all said the exact same one. This whole story of when my grandpa was growing up, and he was growing up, and he was, the, he was kind of the runt of the litter. He had older sisters, and so he would want to play with his older sisters and their neighborhood friends. And so you guys know what it is, and if you're a child in here and you have an older sibling, you know you want to be that older sibling. You want to play with your older sibling's friends. And if you are the older sibling, you do not want your younger sibling to play with you and your friends. But um, his sister let him play with them, and so they were playing hide-and-go-seek. And so my grandpa at the time, just this little guy, remember he thought he was having a really good hiding spot. He goes and hides, and his sister is the one that's it first. He tells this story with so much detail, and when he would tell that story, it would just crack me up every time. But he said he would go and hide by the house in the bushes. And so he said his sister, whose name was Doris, as soon as she got done counting to whatever number they went to, she would turn around and she would look right at him, walk right over to him, and he thinks he's hiding really well. And she would just say this line to him, Nevo, hide in bushes. Nevo hide in bushes and he would tell this story and he would say it like that and it doesn't really mean anything but for some reason it stuck with me and so I'm playing hide and seek with my kids and as we're hiding inside the first thing I'm thinking about they always go to the same spots and I'm always like Nevo hide in the bed Nevo hide in the toy closet I know you're going there and in fact a couple years ago my kids were playing in the bushes out front, and they were hitting the bushes and playing or whatever, and a bee came out and stung my oldest son, Zeke, and he's wailing and crying, and I'm trying to be a good dad, but you know the only thing that stuck in my head? Never hide in bushes. The line doesn't mean anything, but it stuck with me. 
Maybe you have a story like that, some ridiculous phrase that for some reason stays in your mind. This is years and years and years ago that I was even told the story. And the first thing that pops in my head when my son gets stung by a bee in a bush, you should have known. Never hide in bushes. This phrase means nothing. But it stuck with me all these years. Not because it was there, but because I connected with the story. See, we're starting this new series today, this morning, and it's called Story Time. And they're stories that Jesus told. But these stories that Jesus told are not goofy grandpa stories that stick in your mind for ridiculous, silly reasons. No, what these stories provide us is actual insight into the kingdom of God. What we call these stories are parables. And I want to give you a simple definition for parables. Simple definition for you for this series is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Phrase that's been around for a long time. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. See, Jesus, who is this master teacher, Jesus, who's the savior of the world, the most well-known, most influential person to ever walk this earth. He would teach, most commonly seen in scripture in this form, in parables. He would tell stories. And honestly, it's super incredible. Out of all the complexities of the kingdom of God, out of all the complexities of this earth, the ability to translate and to be impactful through time and culture and language, this way that he would teach would connect with people and stick with them through this idea of stories. One thing I want you to know, one thing that you have to know about Jesus, and it may seem obvious, but it needs to be stated. The most clear view of who God is, is seen in the man of Jesus. The most clear view of who God is, is seen in this man Jesus. While God is mysterious, there is no mystery in who God is. It's clearly stated in scripture in the form of Jesus. We don't have to wake up and wonder, what does God want from my life? What is God's desire for me? What does he actually want from me? Jesus tells us, and he tells us most often in stories like the one we're going to cover today. One aspect of family service that I absolutely love is we're all in this auditorium right now, watching online. We hear the scripture, and it doesn't matter if you're five years old or if you're 85 years old. The truth and the challenge applies to us all. And what's a form of teaching that could connect a five-year-old and an 85-year-old? It's a story. We're all in different walks of life. We have different positions in society, different family dynamics. You know, even in the wake of a devastating week in the news, when we ask God, what can I do? What am I supposed to do in this moment in time? And the scriptures tell us. And you know what the scriptures tell us? is in the form of a story. Not a 95 page thesis or 36 objectives for you to go ahead and check off. No, in the form of a story, in the form of a parable. This morning we're gonna go over Luke chapter 10 and when Jesus shares this well-known parable and it's labeled the Good Samaritan. It starts this way in verse 25. I want you to read with me. It says, and behold, a lawyer. Stop right there for a second, a lawyer. Other translations say this, an expert in the law. When you hear lawyer, don't think of guilty, innocent, or whatever, objection, whatever comes in your mind with the lawyer. In that time, it was an expert in the law. An expert in the law, they held a lot of societal influence, a lot of political influence, and religious influence. If you're an expert in the law, if you're a lawyer in this, in this way, you are seen as very highly influential. Someone who studies the scripture. Here's what the lawyer did. He stood up to put him, talking to Jesus, to the test. Here's what he asked. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And here's how Jesus responded. What is written in the law? Now here's this phrase. It's not the law on the books, but the law of scripture. He's referencing the Old Testament. It's more specifically, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five, known as the Torah, known as the law. He says, what does the law tell you? Remember, this guy who's asking the question is already an expert in the law, and so he's asking Jesus what's the most important, and Jesus turns the question around. You're the expert. What do you think is the key? How do you read it? Verse 27, here's how he answered. The lawyer answered Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Go and do this and you will live. 
See, this could have been the end of the interaction. The question was asked, the question was reversed, and then when he got his answer, Jesus said, yep, you got it. Go on. But see, seems like he could have got it, but this lawyer, this expert of the law, he wasn't concerned with just head knowledge. He wasn't lacking in that department. He knew the right answer on what you say out loud. But there's this another aspect, I believe, on why Jesus taught in stories and parables. It's not just about giving you information for your mind. But see, what stories do is they have a direct tie to your heart. I'm sure that these principles we're going to talk about this morning with the Good Samaritan, it's not going to be ground-shaking for you that Jesus asked you to treat people this way. But maybe there needs to be a connection, not just to your mind and your knowledge, but a connection directly to your heart. Maybe it's not an information issue. Maybe it's a heart issue. Goes on to say this, but he was desiring the lawyer to justify himself, so he said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied this way, a man was going down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, thieves, who stripped him, beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road. He saw him and passed by on the other side. Here's this first person in the story that finds this beaten man in this parable that Jesus is saying, and it's a priest. If anyone's going to help you, it's a priest. Imagine Steve Moss walking down the street, and you're sitting there on the other side, and Steve looks at you and goes, nope. Go off to the other side. Now, Steve would never do that to you, friends. Steve would never do that to you. But this is the story in the parable. A priest passed on by, desperately needing help, and a priest decides to go to the other side. Goes on to say this. Likewise, second person came. It was a Levite. And when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, Levite here is a person from the tribe of Levi. And here's what you need to know. All priests come from the tribe of Levi, but not all Levites are priests. This is still kind of the who's who of Jewish culture. It's kind of this classic person. All bald people are beautiful, but not all beautiful people are bald. You know what I'm saying? That's what it's like. That's what you guys know is true. That's why you're laughing. You know it's true. But here we have in this moment that a priest goes by, ignores and passes him. Then a Levite goes by, goes and passes him. And Jesus goes on. This is when Jesus gets pretty spicy with his stories. Here's what he says. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he had saw him, he had compassion. Now, there's a lot that you could read into this. He was a Samaritan. This was the most hated group by the Jewish people at this time. I'm going to oversimplify the situation real quick. But basically, think of this. Samaritan to Jew is basically your family member that betrayed your family over and over and over again. They hijacked your religious beliefs. They changed them to fit their own, depending on who was conquering them at the time. And oh yeah, they still live in your same neighborhood. This is the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. But this Samaritan, here's what the Samaritan did. He not just had compassion on him. Here's what the scriptures tell us. That he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he sat on his own animal and brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Here's what he said, take care of him, and whatever you spend, I will repay you whenever I come back. Not only in this story, the Samaritan who's sworn enemy of the people, the only one to care for this beaten man, but he stops And not only does he stop, but he goes over and beyond what it means to take care of somebody in need. Beyond any type of reasonable expectation that anybody would have for him. Don't miss this aspect. But you may miss it because there has historical translations. But this is not a feel-good story that Jesus is telling to the lawyer, to the expert of the law. This is not a story that enlights these these butterfly feelings inside the expert of the law. This was downright offensive. If you would tell an expert of the law that a priest walked by, that a Levite walked by, but a Samaritan stopped, and not just stopped, but cared for him, and not just cared for him, but cared for him beyond any reasonable expectation of that time, this was downright offensive to the person asking the question. Jesus isn't stepping on toes. Jesus is taking the whole leg off the man. He's that offensive. Can't miss that. I want to make an observation about this parable, and I want to draw some application points. 
I know it's easy to get crazy and fidgety right now, but please hone in with me, and I promise that the scriptures will teach us something that won't just last us through the day, but can change your life forever and change the life of those you come into, into interaction with. Tune back in for a moment right here. In verse 33 and 34, here's what Jesus says about the Samaritan. It says, when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds. See, at first the Samaritan saw, and then the Samaritan cared and felt. And the last thing he did is then the Samaritan acted. See, our society, our culture is weird. Culture is strange. It's always shifting and changing. And it seems right now there's kind of this odd social pressure. Maybe you don't feel it. Maybe it's just me. But we have to stop and care about everything. Now, that's not a bad thing. There are some crazy, insane injustices in the world, and I think God cares deeply about all of them. But you almost get just like rewarded in society today for just caring. Compassion is almost seen as like a badge of honor that we wear around just to show people how good we are. See, I care about this issue, and all I do is have compassion, see how good I am. That's what society tells us, to have compassion, to have compassion, to have compassion. A part of Jesus or away from Jesus, it doesn't really matter. But there's a difference in this story. It's not just about having compassion. I want you to see this difference. There's a difference between compassion and There's a difference and fill in the blank versus compassion but fill in the blank. There's a massive difference when you have compassion and against compassion but when you look, seeing what happens whenever the scriptures tell us that Jesus had compassion. Go through a few examples. Luke 7, a widow's son has died. Scriptures literally say Jesus had compassion and went and rose her son from the dead. Matthew 15, Jesus had compassion on the crowd who were hungry and weary people who were going, going and listening to him. It said he had compassion and then he fed them. Matthew 20, he was moved to compassion. Scriptures literally word for it. Jesus, because he was moved from compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. And immediately they regained their sight and they began to follow him. See, compa- uh, compassion is followed by action in this parable because compassion is always followed by action in the life of Christ. What say you? What happens when God brings compassion to your heart? Is it a compassion and, or is it a compassion but fill in the blank. We're filled with compassion, but I'm not Jesus. I can't really raise people from the dead. I can't give blind people their sight. I can't feed 5,000 people. So I have compassion for them, but I can't be Jesus. So that's kind of my way out. I have compassion. We play this game. We fill in the blanks. Maybe the priest and the Levite may have had the same excuse. Listen, I, I see that person on the side of the road. And I know they need help, but I have compassion. Like, I really feel bad for them. But today's not a good day. Like, I got a lot going on. I have compassion, but do you know all the other things that I'm involved in? I can't really take time to do that. I have compassion, but I'm just way too, what's our favorite word of the day? Busy. I have compassion, but I'm just way too busy. If your compassion doesn't lead you to action, is it real compassion you are feeling, or is it just a badge of honor that we are wearing? I have compassion, but the person on the side of the road, they probably deserved it. They probably had it coming to them. They probably did certain actions previously or agreed with somebody or did something in their life. They had this sin in their life, and so see what happens to them. I would help them, and I have compassion, but they probably deserved whatever happened to them filled with compassion, but they think differently than me. They believe differently than me. They voted differently than me. And so I don't really think it's my place to really go out. Can I confess something to you? Don't have it written down, but feel the need to confess. Here's my excuse. I have compassion, but I don't know if it's really my place to do anything about that. What is your excuse for why your compassion never leads you to action? Filled with compassion, but they have sin in their life. Filled with compassion, but it's not really my place. I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. Somebody else else can take care of it. Somebody that's better equipped. I don't know what your excuses are, but I believe that God's desire for us and his followers is to have compassion and fill in the blank instead of compassion and followed by excuse. Here's the key to this, though. 
Not because we can solve their problems. You cannot solve that person's problem. But you know who can. We can help take care of somebody that's in a down spot. And maybe what you just need to do is speak to them. We talked about this with our students a couple, just last week. And when you have compassion and it leads you to do something, maybe what you need to do is to just acknowledge that they exist. You need to acknowledge the pain that they are feeling. You don't have to justify why you feel this way, or you don't have to justify why they are in the spot that they are in. Jesus doesn't ask you to be the judge. No, Jesus asks us to be compassionate people in this story of the Good Samaritan. He wants you to be filled with compassion and provide something. You know, James said something <clears throat> from stage a few years ago, and it stuck with me this whole time is that we often evaluate ourselves and our characteristics based on a one-time act. And the example he was speaking of specifically was about generosity. And he says, we often view ourselves as generous based on one-time acts. And so if you had a one-time act in which you feel they need generously, you then classify yourself as a generous person here on out. It's not really a characteristic that you show on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, but there's that one time that you did something kind, you did something generous, therefore you are now a generous person. And here's my fear. When we read a well-known story like the Good Samaritan, we will believe that we are the Samaritan in this story, that I am a good guy, and why? Because there was that one time that I had compassion with somebody that's different than me, and therefore Jesus isn't really talking to me in this story, and so I don't really have to do anything else. That's my fear. Please catch this. God is more concerned with what you are doing than what you've already done. God is more concerned about what you are currently doing than what you've already done. Listen, in this parable, Jesus doesn't just tell stories off the top of his head. He's like, God... And he knows what he's saying. Do you think he understands the implications of a Samaritan that has the baggage of Samaritan? Do you know what that Samaritan has done and has gone through? But it didn't matter what the Samaritan had went through. It mattered what the Samaritan was doing in the moment. The priest and the Levite that just walked by, I'm sure that they were filled with good deeds. They'd done some really good things for the kingdom of God in the past. But Jesus isn't so concerned about that with what are you doing right now? God isn't so concerned with what you've done. He's more concerned with what are you doing now with the life that he's giving you. In the first situation, right? Here, let me start with this. When we take the focus off of who we are and we place it off of what we've done in the past, we depend more on ourselves than we depend on who God currently is in our lives. See, in this first situation, when we focus on what we've done in the past, we are the hero, we're the hero when we focus on what we've done before. I don't have to do this right now. I'm too busy right now, or this is too difficult a situation. But do you know what I've done before? Who's the hero in that story? It's me. But if our actions flow out of who we are, based on who God, what God is doing in our lives right now, you're no longer the hero in that story. No, God is the only one that matters. When you don't focus on what you've done, but what God is doing in your life, you're giving God credit for who he is. And in this story of the Good Samaritan, man, there is so much truth. There are so many toes being stepped on, but there's such life-giving truth with what Jesus is sharing in this story. One of the passages I was reading recently was 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and this is powerfully in the way that it hit me. Paul is writing to the church, and he's talking about a whole list of sinful behavior. And I know a lot of people, myself included, that can get behind that list and say, yeah, you tell them, Paul. You tell them, Paul. These people that are acting this way, I want to read this part to you. He's talking about who do not inherit the kingdom of God, nor the thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunks, nor the slanderers, nor the swindlers, and will inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul stops, and here's what he says. And that's what, what some of you were. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Do you hear in that, in that chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the gospel changed everything. Paul goes, that's what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. 
Our parable ends this way. Jesus is finishing the story. And here's what he asked the man. Which of these do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Here's how the lawyer answered. The one who showed him mercy. Here's what Jesus is telling our church. Here's what Jesus is telling you. Here's what Jesus is telling followers worldwide. You go and do likewise. I'm sure there are different people in this room, different people listening online. But if you are a person who has received grace, if you see that 1 Corinthians 6 passage and you can relate to some of those lifestyle choices, but he said, but you're no longer like that. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. If you're in that camp of those who claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, Jesus is telling you to go and to likewise. You've received this grace, and our only goal, our only objective in this life is to go and dispense that grace to other people. And you do that when you act like the Good Samaritan. It doesn't matter what's going on or what has happened before. No, it just matters what God wants you to do in this life, the next step. And if you're a person on the other side, that you maybe have not received Jesus as Lord, you've not received Jesus as Savior, boy, do I got a deal for you. That we have an opportunity to accept Jesus for who Jesus is. And listen, not that we have all the answers, not that we have it all figured out, but we know what it means and what it looks like to give our lives over to Christ. See, second service, we have a young person who's going to be getting baptized. And I know you guys, first service, just want you guys to know about that second service because of how cool it is to see life change in the life of people. But that opportunity is not just reserved for second service. That opportunity is for all who want to accept. We would love that if you want an opportunity to talk about somebody about what faith looks like, what does it mean to receive this grace that Paul talks about? What does it mean to have this story time, not just be something in my head, but something in my heart? We would love to talk to you. And so when we stand and we sing, if you would like to talk to somebody, we'll have some people out here on the sides, an opportunity for you to talk. Let's go ahead and stand. We are about to sing. I want to pray for us, and then the band will lead. Father, thankful for this story of the Good Samaritan. God, thankful for this opportunity we have to accept your grace. God, we know that we do not have all the answers that... Our, our grace, our salvation isn't based off good works, but God, if we know who you are, if we've received your grace and your son, Father, that we should go and do likewise. Help us to love people that look different than us, that think differently than us, that believe differently than us, not because they deserve the help, but because you love them enough for us to step out of our comfort zone. Father, we are thankful for this church. We are thankful for the opportunities you give us to worship you. Um, God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we can pray.